sorry, I've got to put my little thing on here. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Nicole, thank you so much for inviting me here. I cannot believe I've never been to Australia. Um, and even, I'm not sure I've ever even been in the Southern Hemisphere. It's so embarrassing. Um, so I'm, I'm so Western focused. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me and being such a gracious host. Um, I do worry, of course, about what I'm going to talk about not being particularly relevant to the Australian urban context. But um, I thought I'll just give you an American version of things, and you can take from it what you can in terms of relevance. Um, I will say that um, the reputation here from the US perspective of what goes on planning-wise in terms of being progressive and sustainable and at the forefront, I feel like the reputation is perhaps ahead of what the reality actually is here. This is what I've been kind of learning. Um, so it's, to me, you guys are doing fan Something's going right then. Um, also, I want to mention that Nicole tried very hard, and Michael Bounds, um, tried very hard to show me grunge uh, Sydney yesterday, and I was not impressed with that at all. Um, it was all walkable, wonderful urbanism, as far as I could tell. But um, there is uh, Google Earth, and um, I did go in and, and scout around what's going on out there. Um, there is some some um, less than hopeful stuff going on out there. So um, anyway, um, I, I'm going to talk about something um, near and dear to my heart, something I've been writing about for a long time now. And that is the holy grail of urban planning, which is to create neighborhoods that are compact, walkable, and diverse. Now, this compact, walkable, diverse, it's kind of like a mantra. Um, we say it a lot over in the US. We've been uh, trying very hard to accomplish such places. And I think um, the reality, what's been happening uh, most recently in my basic thesis um, is you know, compact and walkable are not uh, coincident with diverse. Um, they're becoming separate. And that's perhaps um, kind of well known, but um, I'll try to dig through that a little bit and perhaps shed some light on um, some of the particulars of that situation. Um, you know, one thing that um, is fascinating is how long this goal has been in play. And you know, going back to the first responses to the industrial city, and that would be Ebenezer Howard, um, one of the first. You know, he really was kind of after the compact, walkable, diverse urbanism in a way. I don't agree at all with um, Jane Jacobs' assessment of Ebenezer Howard as being um, an evildoer because this was the first. This was a walkable kind of proposal. This was also a diverse proposal. This was about social complexity in the form of, um, of pretty compact and, and by necessity walkable kinds of environments. So as I said, basic thesis here, compact walkable should be together with diverse. They're moving apart and that worries me as an urban planner. And I'm gonna at the end propose what we might think about are some strategies to, um, to kind of counteract that tendency. Um, now, I like to show these um, images of um, London from Charles Booth, late 19th century. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with these, but um, they're all online, by the way. Fascinating stuff. One of the first people to map out what was happening socially in um, a spatial context. And um, if you can get over this incredibly politically incorrect way of referring to people as lowest class vicious semi-criminals, um, <laughs> what you have here is mapping out of rich and poor living you know, very close to each other. So you have compact, you have walkable by necessity, and you have diversity. Um, but, you know, of course, we're, we can't lose sight of the fact that the other thing going on at this time was incredible social stratification just in terms of social mores. So um, you had your place. You know, people were living next to each other, rich and poor. Here's some rich folks strolling through the, 
the poor sections, and they weren't threatened by that because they knew that they were higher up in the pecking order. This was maintained through clothing, through you know customs of various kinds. So what we're trying to do now is get compact, walkable, diverse in a society where some equality has really been achieved. Um, not all, but um, we have certainly made a lot of progress in the last century. I'm going to be showing you some examples um, of what's going on in Chicago, because I live in Chicago half of the year, kind of commuting to Arizona State, which is um, a little odd, but uh, I love Chicago so much. And um, it's also a fantastic place to study urbanism. And um, it's kind of the, it's the third largest city in the US. Um, and uh, I have reams and reams of data about what's been going on socially. And I've been mapping, um, I'm particularly interested in measuring um, diversity of different kinds. And I just want to show you quickly about you know, the situation in Chicago, and it's mirrored across the US. Here's income diversity in 1970. You see you have a lot of um, diversity in the city itself, which is the red outline. By 2010, you see what's happening. Those more diverse areas are kind of moving out to the suburbs. So you're kind of losing. It's evidence of loss of that connection between compact, walkable, and diverse. Um, this situation is also reflected in incredible racial um, segregation going on in, in um, many, most cities in, in um, the US. You can see these areas in the south side of Chicago more than 75% African American. So this is incredible, intense segregation going on. So it's all interrelated. Um, the um, income segregation has a similar um, kind of problem going on, and it's getting worse. The trend is not so good. So um, the, what just I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, because I feel I'm probably preaching to the choir here about the what and the why of diversity, why, it's, uh, why we need diversity. Um, in terms of the what of diversity, um, I like to look at it from multiple angles. Um, and this is just a graphic kind of showing, um, OK, at the top there, family type diversity, um, income diversity, which I happen to think is the most important thing that we're going for here, um, age diversity, and at the bottom, racial and ethnic diversity, also very important. So any of these things, any of these dimensions of diversity are important in, um, in urbanism. As well, use diversity. Um, now, the use diversity and social diversity, of course, go together. Um, if you're going to have a diverse place, you need to have the services to um, service that diversity. So it kind of compels um, a very complex uh, mixed use kind of environment. Um, and then the very important point of what scale are we talking about. So if you're talking about the whole city of Chicago, it's very diverse, right? Um, if you, you're outlined in pink there, if those are all the areas you're including. Once you start narrowing that down, you can no longer talk about diversity. Um, my interest and what I, I think is really important and what it's all about is neighborhood scale diversity. And if you, you know, shrink down that pink box, you can see you very quickly lose diversity. The other thing is um, cities are incredibly diverse in their public spaces. But the kind of diversity that I think is important for urban planners to be um, achieving, um, and the kind of diversity that Eb certainly Ebenezer Howard might have envisioned, is diversity where people are living possibly working, but definitely interacting in a way that they are um, they're localized and they are engaged you know, very locally in their place. So they're living and working in the neighborhood. That's very different from the kind of diversity which I'm showing here up in Millennium Park, that's downtown Chicago. Diversity anywhere in, in Sydney, um, if tourists are just mingling through, that has a certain value, of course. Um, people of all different creeds you know, interacting in some way in public space I think is always a, a good thing. But it's very different from that kind of um, uh, cohabitation at the neighborhood level where you live there. Um, that's a very different kind of a thing. People often ask me, 
um, well, what about you know, these ethnic neighborhoods? Are you saying we shouldn't be having ethnic neighborhoods? And um, of course, I'm no way am I saying that. Um, and this is an image of, of a Chinatown on the top there that um, is the Pilsen neighborhood, a, a Hispanic neighborhood in Chicago. Um, this image here is um, a Dutch enclave in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I was born. And um, I have some Dutch relatives who are really into their Dutch heritage. And they were telling me, well, what's wrong with my Dutch enclave? And the response I always give is absolutely nothing wrong, but there's a lot of diversity here. Um, in a healthy, thriving Chinatown in the US, there's income diversity, there's age diversity, there's family type diversity. If you start to gravitate toward a, mono, toward a monoculture, um, and it's an ethnic enclave of solidly poor people or solidly old people, that's when you start to get some problems. Um, so I've already gone into why diversity a little bit, but let me expound um, just a little bit. Um, all of these problems here, which are um, these are all images of American cities. I don't think you have the same level of problems um, that the American cities do, at least not what I've seen. You certainly don't have, um, as far as I know, the abandonment of large sections of the inner city. Um, and, uh, but all of these kinds of um, urban problems really could be traced back to lack of diversity. Um, this image, for example, of Las Vegas, this is a monoculture. This is, you get this garish kind of um, uh, urban scene as a result of a monoculture such that all the, all the casinos are just crying out for attention. And one has to be distinguished from the other, and so they're competing with each other in that way. Um, this is obviously a case of concentrated poverty, lack of income diversity in that kind of neighborhood. The traffic congestion, of course, is about people just being incredibly spread out and not living and working in a more close-in kind of um, situation. Houston on the top there, um, what a disaster that town is. Um, but it's uh, you know, also a situation of la lack of land use diversity more than anything. So um, there's a large literature on diversity, um, on what are the benefits of diversity, and I won't spend a whole lot of time. Let me just list them. Um, the economic argument, um, it's about cross-fertilization of ideas, um, good for small business, mutual support, economic interdependence. These are the kinds of things that Jane Jacobs talked about. Um, adding vitality and interest to a place is good for business. Um, apart from all of that, and that's more of the um, more of the Richard Florida kind of diversity um, sense of things. I think it has a place. Um, the social argument, um, this is the one that resonates greatly with many um, American planners, the need to eliminate concentrated poverty. If you're going to eliminate concentrated poverty, the um, opposite of that is diversity. That's, that's the only way to kind of look at it. Um, you can't have um, non-concentrative poverty and non-diversity. Um, equitable distribution of resources, that's a huge one too because um, there are limited resources in um, cities. And so you can't, every neighborhood can't have an equal distribution of great stuff, right? So um, the, you need to um, have diversity in order to maximize equitable access to, um, to these resources. There's a whole literature in sociology on the importance of building tolerance, familiarity, daily contact, reduction of fear. Um, there's a more pragmatic argument having to do with security, having to do with, um, you know, you want different users at different times of the day. If everybody's on the same schedule, if everyone's of the same kind of economic class, driving in, driving out to their homes, you don't get that kind of natural surveillance. Um, this is one reason why um, in Phoenix I live in a neighborhood with a lot of students. And honestly, I like it because they keep all hours. And um, it, makes, it makes the place feel a little safer, um, as long as they're not being too loud. 
The notion of um, aging in place, I think that's a term that um, I've heard around in conversations here too. You know, wanting to change the type of housing unit that you're in and not necessarily having to jump around the city and move to different neighborhoods. The sustainability argument, that's a huge one. Um, reduction of miles traveled. If you have your store clerks living 50 miles away, you know that's just a basic reduction of VMT kind of argument in favor of diversity. Um, the parallels with neighborhood resilience, you know, there's a whole movement, I'm, I'm sure it's here too, to not have these huge, you know, corporate farms all of one crop. What you want is um, organic farming, which has a diversity of crops, and that's much healthier. It's much better for the planet. Um, and I think there's an interesting um, analogy there with humans. So diversity is giving us all these things, right? So what about the compact walkable side of the equation? Well, this is even easier. Um, I think, uh, you know, for the environment, everybody's heard all this stuff now. I think the research is so overwhelming. It's been two decades now of maybe more, probably more, um, you know, linking compact walkable environments to lower VMT, lower energy requirements, impervious surface, you know, um, getting people off uh, land and reducing land consumption, et cetera, et cetera, making transit feasible, making um, uh, shared dis uh, energy um, district-wide heating. I don't know if you have that thing here, but um, those kinds of things, shared heat and power, feasible. For individuals, um, it's about, you know, there's a huge literature on health benefits of compact walkable, um, safety, social connection. These things are all out there and pretty, um, pretty uh, well known now. Okay, so the good news about all of this, I would say. Um, I think in the US we've really turned the corner with this obsession with low density, with low density suburban living. Um, and not with everybody, um, and I'll show you some figures in a minute. Um, at first, when we were talking about density, we were confused, I think, with equating density with urbanism, and they're definitely not the same thing. Um, you have to really, um, you know, there were experiments with, you know, high density kinds of dwellings with um, landscape urbanism or whatever this is. But um, I think we've gotten a lot better with that, and I think now it's all about walkable urbanism. That is the thing. And uh, I think it's kind of a no-brainer. I think a lot of people think it's a no-brainer. And I'm not, and here's the data to, to prove it. This is a survey that was done of 10,000, or was it 100,000? I'm forgetting. Um, uh, US, uh, you know, Americans, the Pew Community Survey. And take a look at this number of people now saying that they are willing to live smaller, closer um, school stores and walking distance. This is huge, huge change in the American population. If you gave this survey in the 50s or 60s or 70s, it wouldn't have been anywhere near this. And so a lot of people, and this just came out a few months ago, and a lot of people were like, wow, this is really amazing, this change. Now, um, this is, I, do you, anybody know who these dudes are? These are the Koch brothers, and they are the evildoers in the U.S. They own, um, you know, oil refineries, and they own coal-powered um, plants, and they are spewing, um, you know, horrible stuff into the atmosphere. And... Um, Trying to rein, so that's a huge part of global warming, right? So trying to rein them in has really not been working very well because it's just politically been very difficult. However, reining in the other big culprit of global warming, which is the lifestyle of the American middle class, that low-density lifestyle, driving everywhere, um, sprawl, you know, this is some progress. This is some. Pro this is something to really kind of grab hold of. Um, the other thing going on is um, 
this uh, data we have now about preferences really changing. This is a book that just came out last year, Arthur, Arthur Nelson, um, and he was able to show that you know the change in household type in the next 20 years, this, uh, the households without children, that's the category that is really, really growing. So, um, so there's that. Okay, so what I've shown so far is why compact walkable is good, why diversity is good, why it's really, you know, there's this huge demand out there for compact walkable, and this leads us to the problem, of course. Now, before I talk about this problem of um, the disconnection between supply and demand and that really fueling the lack of affordability and therefore the lack of diversity, let me take a little um, detour because I have time. Um, I, talking about walk score and about um, affordable housing. Now, it's my understanding that walk score is not a big deal around here so far. It's, it's really big in my circles. Um, it's been kind of a game changer because for once, it is data for the whole US and the whole world, in fact, um, giving us information, point by point information on the um, walk, walkability of a place. This is tremendous. If you've been in the field for a little while, you know how hard it is to actually get quantified information on things like walkability. Um, so, so um, all right, so just as context for what I'm gonna talk about a little bit, just very briefly about um, a project that I just finished, which was to look at walkability and affordable housing and look at how much, the, you know, how in sync they are. So um, I don't know if you know about the, what goes on with affordable housing in the US, but it's a pretty amazing story of, you know, this was what was being built in the 50s and 60s and 70s too. Um, this is Chicago. These are the, you know, very famous Robert Taylor homes. Well, you know, all of that stuff has come down. It's just gone. Um, it was such a disaster. It was just, you know, as it was in many places all over the world. Perhaps this isn't new to you, but maybe it's, um, it's interesting in that it all came down. Um, and uh, so that um, was replaced with this new idea about, and even Obama was into it, and still is, so I'm told, um, uh, this push for walkable communities. And we want our public housing to be in walkable places. Um, and it's all about sustainable communities and it's all about you know, that good stuff. And that was on you know, a very high level of, of government. And um, so a uh, trickle down effect of that was uh, to secure some funds to do some research on the connection between affordable housing um, and um, and walkable communities. So where are we with this situation? Now, what we did in our study was we acquired walk, massive amounts of walk score data. Um, and, we, and what's cool about walk score, um, and actually we use something called street smart walk score. Um, oh, and I pulled out um, what's going on with Sydney um, with walk score, and you'll be happy to know Sydney is the most walkable Australian city. Um, Melbourne is below you. I understand that's probably a good thing. Um, but still, you're only at 63, which isn't that great. But you know, it's that's that's for the whole city. So um, you know, don't don't fear too much. It's the score is um, zero to 100. And pretty much 80 and above is decent walkable. I'll show you some um, examples of that. But here's the street smart walkable part of this, which is a, it's not, so walk score is all about access to amenities, right? So it's a great um, proxy for neighborhood context. And what's really good about it is it used to be um, this kind of situation at top at the top, where it was just as the crow flies distance to amenities. And that was not really that great. And so now the new part, the new strategy is with Street Smart, and it's actually giving you distances via the street network to all these amenities. So that's an immense improvement. 
There are, the way it works, just, you know, if you're interested, um, there are these weights that it applies to different kinds of services. So grocery stores are ranked really high, um, restaurants, shopping, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also a proxy for pedestrian friendliness, intersection density, and average block length are two other variables that they, they put in there. So, um, you know, to have this kind of information globally, um, is amazing. There's been some pushback with some people saying this doesn't really, this isn't enough for walkability because what about the width of the sidewalk? What about lighting? What about crime? What about, you know, all these other factors having to do with, with that really characterize um, a neighborhood? And um, there's been some studies now, quite a few. I've done some, of my, one myself. Um, looking at the correlation between a walk score and micro measures of neighborhood environment. And it's amazing correlation. I mean, it, it works out pretty well. So what we did was we had data by census block group for the whole US. And a census block group is around 1,500 people. So um, kind of a smallish neighborhood, I would say. Um, and we have. 174,000 of these block groups that are in the, um, the MSAs, which are the metropolitan areas. So we're not looking at rural or anything like that. These are cities across the US. And you know the results summary, bottom line, HUD units, that's affordable housing, um, subsidized housing, I should say, um, with really good access, which is that 80 and above access, um, only 10% of them. Um, the um, HUD units in completely unwalkable locations, 71%. So you can see that you have a problem there. You have a problem with putting people of lower economic means in places where they can't get to anything. And um, we also did some research with public transit, and you know that was not helping one bit. Um, so for the city of Chicago, again, we can uh, map out those most walkable places in yellow. The, the green dots are you know, 5% or more of subsidized housing in a block group. And you see you don't have a good correlation problem. Now, what about just for the US as a whole? Forget about the public housing residents, just anyone in the US. The percent living in a walkable location, 80 and above, 7%. So this is, this is definitely a problem, because we keep in mind that um, incredible demand coming um, by uh, you know, the, the survey and the, you know, the work done by Anthony Nelson, uh, Arthur Nelson, um, you know, this huge demand coming down the pike, absolutely nowhere near being able to satisfy that. Now, a walk score of 80 is not anything intensely dense. Um, this happens to be a street segment in Queens, New York, outside of New York City. Um, you've got average density of 18 units per acre. I don't know what it would be for hectare, but um, you know this is not hugely, um, hugely urban. Um, I pulled this out for Merrickville. Your walk score is 80, um, so that's good. But you know it's not like off the charts or anything. But um, I. What? Oh, all right. Is that where you live? Oh, way to go. <laughs> You're doing okay, Nicole. Um, okay, so now here's, so here's the problem. Um, I've been looking at housing prices. Uh, this is the other piece of data that we acquired. I am so buried in data right now. It's just unbelievable. And I think this is, this is a strength we have now the data, the big data, um, the, the walk score data you can get, and the housing price per square foot data you can get from these real estate companies. And by the way, one of them called Redfin just bought walk score. So the, the real estate industry um, and you know, the apartment rental companies and everything are very much in cahoots with walk score because they see that as um, you know, a, a way to sell real estate. Although I've been told that some people are actually using walk score to look for the low walk scores, and that's where they want to live. You know, people looking for suburban housing. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
So we looked at, okay, for places, neighborhoods, lower than seven units per acre, so pretty low density, the, this is the way housing price is distributed by quartiles, okay? Pretty even, um, high, medium, high, et cetera. Here's how it changes when you start getting those high walk score neighborhoods. Um, you have, you know, it's just totally different. Um, those walk score neighborhoods are commanding incredibly high prices. If you look even higher density, and I'm, um, I pulled out a copy of this book. This book is getting a lot of play in the US right now. It's a professor at Columbia University, Vishan Chakraborty, Barty, and um, he's pushing 30 dwelling units to the acre in his Country of Cities book. And he's saying, if we're gonna be a sustainable country, we need to get to 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, and uh, you know that for that group, this is the way housing prices are distributed. So you've got a, a little bit of a problem there. Um, so if we look at places that are walkable, not affordable, those are those, that yellow area of Chicago that I showed a minute ago, and you look at the diversity situation. So how is like compact walkable intersecting with diversity? Um, I've been really interested in looking at how those patterns are changing over time. So this is the 2010 pattern. Take a look at um, that same, uh, those same red dots relative to 1970 income diversity. And you see that before, we had a lot more association between walkable um, places, which are not, now not affordable, and um, income diversity. So again, we're trying to get to neighborhoods that are compact, walkable, diverse. In other words, affordability in desirable places. What could be some strategies for that? Um, we're not gonna just throw up our hands and let uh, the market decide because we're urban planners and we like to intervene. That's what it's all about. And we like to come up with ideas. You know, what can we do here? Um, one idea is, um, now I say move to Buffalo <laughs> because um, you know, it really, what is needed is to disperse the population a little bit because actually, um, walk score came out recently, this is very recent, uh, September. Um, you know, all these places that are affordable and walkable and, you know, they're still out there. So move to one of those places. And actually, Buffalo is at the top of the list. And this just came out the other day. Um, showing where the 20 to, you know, that really key demographic of 25 to 34, where are they moving, where have they been moving? And it's amazing to me that New York is just at the, you know, average, and some of these other cities are doing a lot better of, you know, attracting that younger crowd. So that's a good thing, and Buffalo is doing pretty well. Okay, of course, subsidy is a huge one. So we have all these neighborhoods we know about that are walkable and compact and not diverse, meaning they're not affordable. So there's like a bazillion subsidies that you could try to tap into in the US. The land trust, the you know, zoning requirements having to do with inclusion. Don't try to read all this. This is just for effect of all these things that you could do, all these policies, strategies, incentives, zoning approaches, federal, state, local governments, the nonprofit sector. This stuff is so tiring. And um, I was, you know, talking to the city um, of Sydney planners today, and they're, you know, trying so hard to tap into all this stuff. And it's really, it's very hard, but it is something, it's one of the strategies to um, keep working on. And get these strategies to align with putting affordable housing, subsidized housing in these walkable locations. Because um, as I was showing, you know, for our nationwide uh, survey of what's going on, affordable and walkable are not congealing. New towns. Um, you know, this is something that the new urbanism has been really, really trying to push. And these are just, um, it really is an attempt to get diverse, uh, walkable, diverse environment, neighborhoods, environments, towns 
without any subsidy. New urbanism tends to be kind of a libertarian-leaning crowd. They're very suspicious of government. Um, you know, some of them, some of the more famous ones, like my buddy Andre Stuani is just like very libertarian. But anyway, their approach is to really try to build it in. So have units of very different sizes and really um, maintain a very strong presence for the public realm around which all this diversity is clinging. Um, so this is um, actually Newtown St. Charles outside of St. Louis, Missouri, so right in the middle of the country. It's a really interesting place. They built these canals there. I have no idea how sustainable that practice is. But, um, so I, I did it. I've been fighting the new urbanists for years about their claim that they are building diverse neighborhoods. And I keep saying, no, you're actually not. Um, and you need to get onto that policy side. You can't just build in the diversity that you're after. That's important to do, essential to do, but it's not all. Um, easy for me to say, right? But so I, I you know, got all this data on these 320 new urbanist projects, traditional neighborhood developments, as they're called. This is where they're distributed. And I looked at, you know, what could a teacher, a median income person, and a cook making um, the average salary in these different developments, um, could they afford to buy a one bedroom, the lowest price unit in one of these developments? And I made some assumptions about their ability to, you know, get a mortgage and, and all that stuff. And I found that, you know, it's really very few of these projects. I, I surveyed 150 something projects. Very few of them actually had the ability to, um, you know, this lower income or even just middle income. We're not ta even talking lower income, we're talking middle income. The ability to buy in there. So the new town thing and the new urbanism, great. One part of the strategies uh, doesn't necessarily do it all. Um, on the design side, as I mentioned, um, you know, you guys are way far ahead of the U.S. in terms of a physical urban form that accommodates diversity. And um, you might know about, you know, the, the Jane Jacobs, um, you know, very um, ideas about what kind of physical environment accommodates diversity. Um, short blocks, you know, that had to do with sustaining businesses because pedestrians would walk more uh, frequently by certain businesses, mixed aged buildings having to do with different price. You know, if you have different um, ages of buildings, that represents different price points. That's a generator of diversity. Pr mixed primary uses, um, sufficient concentration. So you may be familiar with all this, but this was her um, four part um, attempt to do um, a physical form for diversity. The building type that can accommodate units of different sizes within it. Um, this is a Parisian um, apartment block. This is something we don't have a lot of in the US. In the old, bigger, older cities, in their older parts, yes, although they've all been gentrified. And even the little tiny apartments at the top, which were only accessible with staircase, those are you know, unaffordable now, too. But still, having that um, mix of a um, of building, of, a building type that accommodates mix um, is very important. Understanding where places are really lacking in the public realm, lacking, I'm calling these civic deserts. These are blocks. This is a neighborhood in Chicago called Portage Park. And these are places where one uh, living in this neighborhood would not be able to easily access anything. Not a park, not a school, not a library you know, really nothing. So um, these are the kind of places, and, and yet this is a pretty socially diverse neighborhood. So you can tell, you know, you can see that concentrating on the um, civic realm, where it is, who's living by it, and how to structure it is very important. And you need to leverage that civic realm to make the diversity work for you. Um, and here's some examples of, you know, the Woonerf is, is really an important strategy for getting those diverse housing types to kind of knit together. And, and I'm seeing all this, the design side of this is really um, 
not about anything you're going to do with places that are already walkable and so therefore tend to be unaffordable. These design strategies are aimed at places in the city, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which are not, um, you know, need to be more diverse, more, more walkable, and they're kind of ripe for going that direction. So um, this is about sort of um, growing the number of places that you have that could be considered um, walkable, compact, and diverse. You know, we have this weird thing. The relationship between buildings and public space in the U.S. is problematic. Um, and this is an actual place, a park, um, with buildings around it up there. And, you know, you see what, what would be nicer is to have the, build, the houses actually front the public space. It's another idea about, you know, sort of knitting together the diversity that you have and maintaining it. Um, Again, using that civic realm as an integrator of diverse housing types. This is, um, actually, this is showing Phoenix over here on the left. You have park area. The yellow is low-density housing, single-family homes. The, um, the pink area is uh, apart, you know, more um, apartment buildings, as we call them, condos and things. And then the blue is commercial area. You know, what it really should be like is the the blue and the, and the pink, you know, the higher intensity, the mixed use, the apartment buildings, close to the park um, and, you know, being rewarded for this higher density living by having this very close access to, to parks. And so it needs, it's kind of ass backwards. Um, and here's a strategy from my um, architect friends, Dover Cole, really looking at that kind of idea for an infill project. So you take a park, you start to, over time, infill it. Here's what you got eventually. Above all, the um, necessity of having codes that can deal with these very diverse housing types that, um, you know, as change happens, they don't necessarily, um, they don't integrate that well in a way that is sustaining the public realm. Um, the form-based code folks are doing a masterful job of reforming existing zoning so that you do things like you pay attention to frontage type and you integrate building types by you know, making sure that the frontage type is the same across the street. Um, and you know, that you have, a, there's a lot of diversity of building types here, but you see that there's attention being paid to, to um, frontage being the same. Um, whether you're across the street, but you can still integrate building types in a pretty um, micro kind of way. Um, you know, just paying attention to in some of these um, neighborhoods that have just been wrecked by automobiles and, um, you know, they're just really, we call them automobile slums. Um, and, you know, paying attention to where is the 100% corner, as it's called, of the community and making sure that that is a viable civic space that can sustain and help support the diversity that might be growing there. So those are just some design ideas. And then um, strategic investment. The, um, I've been doing, looking at um, where is the city of Chicago spending its money? And um, what I've been finding is there's no correlation between um, wanting to help um, grow walkable, compact, diverse neighborhoods and making some public investments to help that grow. So this is all under the umbrella of at least what we need to do is make, get more of it out there. Obviously, supply is not meeting demand. Let's, let's grow it and make it happen. So, you know, under, these, are the, um, these are block groups again in Chicago. Affordable is... Um, you know, there are some walkable areas that are still affordable, right on that edge of the non-affordable walkable. And you can just see the gentrification just sort of marching along and um, it, about to overtake over all those red areas. Um, you also, you know, have a lot of places that are not walkable, but they've got density. Um, and those are the areas in purple there. And I think that one, when we talk about strategic investment, one idea might be to really focus on those places that already have the density. So they 
ought to be um, a, a little less burdened with people who can't handle the increase in density and increase in diversity. Um, and you know, really target those areas helps to sustain them. And here's what I found. You know, this is this is another thing about the big data movement. Do you even have that here? Like open source data. There's just like data everywhere. Um, maybe maybe the U.S. is just catching up to what you folks already have. But anyway, you can now download a GIS shapefile of where investment is being made. And these are the red dots. These are what we call these TIF districts. So this is, um, you know, various little projects that the government is doing: street improvements, capital improvements of various kinds. And you can see that, you know, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to try to align these things in such a way that um, there's support for those areas that are affordable, they're not walkable, and they're dense. Um, you know, that might be a way to kind of grow this walkable urbanism. Um, you know, it's, it's really, um, this is my last slide, just kind of, um, it can be overwhelming thinking about all the problems here because, of course, as we talk about all the improvements in civic realm and we're going to do all this great stuff to these neighborhoods, you're thinking, oh, then they're going to become unaffordable. Um, so it's kind of this delicate balance and back and forth to try to find um, that sweet spot where you're, you're improving, but you're not going all the way to full gentrification. Um, but I, I think the best we can do as planners is, is to keep on top of it, to know where are these compact, walkable, diverse neighborhoods thriving, where are they, where are they turning, where are they um, you know, going one way or the other. They're in constant flux, and um, just having a good handle on what the patterns are, I think, and where we could do strategic investment and other things is not a bad idea. Have I been talking 45 minutes? Okay, I'll stop it there then. Thank you. I'll take your question. And now I can have some more wine. Have some wine. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Emily. That was incredibly stimulating. I think you'll um, really understand why I was so keen to bring her over here. So we're going to have questions, um, try to make them uh, fairly short so we can get um, to lots of questions. Put your hand up. I've got um, two, you know, junior members of the Australian planning, um, you know, intelligentsia around to run some microphones. And we'll go to um, John Toon to start it off. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyway, you haven't mentioned bicycles at all. And here there's a great move with people bicycling around both for recreation purposes, for health purposes, but also for journey to work, journey to shops and things like that. And I think that's a, another dimension which changes the scale of place because a bicycle has a, gives you a bigger range than you can get as a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. Have you any comments on that? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, I should bring in bicycles into this. Um, I'm not really impressed with the bicycle situation in Sydney. It doesn't seem really great, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's um, become hugely important. It's, you know, in the, in the U.S., it's, it is a really big movement. In New York City, they've been closing down streets left and right, but there's a huge fight going on, too, pretty interesting, between the bicyclers and uh, you know, uh, other folks who think it's terrorizing. And actually, bicycles have been killing people. Like the conflict between pedestrians and bicycles. But I don't know why I'm getting negative about it. I think it's, um, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Michael Darcy from uh, the University of Western Sydney. Um, uh, thanks very much, Emily. I, uh, I, I appreciated all those design and, uh, and, and other ideas, but I, I keep coming back to uh, subsidy and regulation, which is kind of another way of subsidy, because having looked at, for, for quite a long time now, the uh, transformation of public housing in the US, and, and, and we've had uh, similar uh, movements here, it seems to me that... Uh, uh, Policymakers uh, love to um, uh, they love to uh, invoke diversity and social mix, so long as they're talking about social mix for poor people, 
uh, who should go and learn how to live like middle class people, but not the other way around. And so that we're actually, we've got examples now of uh, uh, public housing being torn down to move poor people out of poor areas, but at the same time being sold off in wealthy areas in order that rich people can move in there. Um, and this is really about land value, it's not really about diversity. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, um, worried that if we go down to the, the sort of new urbanist path and saying this is all about uh, uh, design, uh, then uh, yeah, we just prepare the ground for uh, the, 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 the re-entry of, uh, of, of the middle class into well-serviced uh, inner city areas. Mm -hmm. I'm totally against that. Um, yeah, that, that is tragic, and, and the new urbanists got themselves caught up in a retracting of government from supporting subsidized housing, and that was terrible PR for them. Um, they didn't really, they, they didn't have any uh, stake in the game. They were just designing these mixed income communities. Meanwhile, the government's tearing down all this high-rise housing with many more units in it and replacing it with mixed income housing. Um, better design, sure, more walkable, sure, but you know, at only a third of the population was able to get into that new mixed income community. So totally tragic. But one thing that's really interesting that's happening is that you mentioned that um, the places being torn down, some of them are in incredibly great locations, especially in New York City. A lot of the public housing there is you know, very and very expensive land. And people are kind of clamoring to, um, to stay put in that place and not just be given a voucher or something to go fend for themselves and, and find another place to live. They want to hang on to that centrally located property because, and you know, that's, that's quite a fight going on in the US actually about that because some of the people in the housing community really want to give people vouchers to move to the suburbs. And there's even a, a wing of affordable housing that wants to now give subsidized cars so that, you know, getting rid of the argument that, well, you know, the argument that I was making, if you put uh, affordable housing residents in the burbs, that's really problematic and burdensome for them. And they say, okay, we'll give them a car then. So. Um, that's kind of, a, kind of a debate going on right now. Um, I, I'm not sure how that's going to resolve itself, but really interesting how that voucher dispersal approach um, is, is now not necessarily seen as, as the best thing. Hanging on to those central locations is better. And by the way, the, the high rises could have been maintained and, and could have worked and could have you know, people could have, could have uh, still be, could still be living there if the money was there to keep them in, maintained, and that just didn't happen. Yeah. Here. Yep. Uh, yeah, my name's Josh. I'm a planning student here at Sydney Uni. Uh, I'm just wondering if you might be able to share a couple of your battle stories against new urbanism, um, specifically sort of relating to, I guess, um, how you know if there is uh, infill development or greenfield development happening in a you know, in a city, um, how you might be able to capture value uh, and be able to provide or improve infrastructure um, so that you can still create a, a mix of income brackets in an area without necessarily uh, imposting that, you know, that new infrastructure cost on, uh, you know, either existing residents or new residents, which I think probably creates a bit of an inequitable outcome. So, in other words, um being able to make improvements to your property and not have it affect the tax situation? Well, no, imp imp sorry. Improving um, like local community infrastructure, whether that be, um, you know, bicycle paths or, uh, you know, local childcare centres or, you know, community transport for elderly people, things like that. And, and what does that have to do with new urbanism? Well, in the sense that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're creating uh, infill development here in New South Wales, uh, there are two ways in which, you know, um, that value uplift, I suppose, is captured, particularly if there's like a, uh, a change in the zone. Uh, and that's through either a, what we call a voluntary planning agreement between the developer and the council. Um, 
you know, so creating new works for local parks, um, or through. Well, I think what I'm not completely sure what you're asking, but um, it, you know, it's always a good thing, I think, for people to improve their property and capture some uh, reward for that. Um, we certainly don't, you know, the whole gentrification thing is really complex because you do have a lot of people, lower income people, who benefit greatly from gentrification. And when, um, you know, they go to sell their property, they've certainly made huge amounts of money. So not everyone is against it. Not everyone who's the existing resident in a gentrifying area is against it. Um, so, so you have these different factions. I mean, again, to me, it's about kind of the prize here is to grow as much complex, diverse urbanism as we can. And we're going to be doing it in all kinds of different ways. We're going to be um, at the, you know, getting more sophisticated about how we can do that. And whether it's, you know, improving one property at a time and, and then, you know, having the whole neighborhood boat be lifted um, without, you know, displacing people, that would, that would certainly be good, right? That might be something to discuss right. a bit more in um, drinks. So I think it's a question about sort of value uplift and how value uplift can offset um, things like affordable housing provision. Oh, is that what you mean? Hmm. So, I, I guess I don't know that term. Yeah, Sorry. But, but we do have a question here. I want to keep it moving. It's a great one, Josh, and we'll, you know, carry it outside. So we've got one here, then we've got Rod, and I think I saw someone else. Yeah, Krista, Chris Annan from the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies at University of Sydney. I've read about a situation in London where um, affordable housing is mandated as part of new developments, but when, the, when they come around to actually building it, they provide separate entrances for the... Um, affordable housing, so the uh, low-income tenants have to go in through an alleyway through the bins and everything, and the wealthier tenants get this grand entrance with a concierge and everything. So it seems that maybe the planners want to build in diversity, but the market is still uh, demanding um, segregation. I think that's horrible. That, that happened in New York City, too. People were so outraged. Separate entrances, one for the riffraff, one for the other people. I, I'm just disgusted by that. I don't even know what to say. I mean. Yeah, quite. Unfortunately, I don't think our buildings are even getting an entrance for, you know, socially, um, the income um, diverse neighborhoods, but anyway, um, communities. Huh. But anyway, Rod, let's go to you. Yeah. Peter, Rod. Sorry, Rod, didn't see you there. You're hiding in front. They'll <laughs> stack me at this rate. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Rod Simpson um, here at the University of Sydney. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about um, the relationship between walkability and car parking policy. Uh, it seems to me that um, one of the strategies is to deliberately devalue land by removing the right to have a car in certain locations, which effectively is a devaluation of that land, which is, a, I think, a positive thing when the neighbourhood is actually walkable. So it's like a complete inversion of some of the mechanisms that we use where we have anti-competitive behaviour in Australia where people are able to build roads and then insist that there's no public transport, for example, in competition. So if we turn that on its head, you'd say, well, here's an inherently walkable neighbourhood and it becomes a self-selection process, actually, where you basically devalue the land and make it attractive to people on and more accessible to people on lower incomes because it's less attractive to people on high incomes because they're not allowed to own a car. Um, what do you think about that and have you come across that in the States as a, a strategy? That's really interesting. Um, it doesn't, it, it works kind of opposite in the US. I mean, most, the majority of New Yorkers, for example, don't have cars. Um, the city of San Francisco now um, does not allow, it, new development does not have to provide any parking. And in fact, it's not allowed to provide any parking. Um, so the translation there is that no parking is actually upping land value in some locations. Um, 
But as a strategy, I mean, it seems like a good strategy if that's working here, as long as it doesn't become a monoculture, as long as it doesn't become uniformly poor people. But I suspect an area that is not dominated by cars, where you don't have a lot of parking, that's got to be a real, that's got to be a booster. I, in Chicago, I'm always, uh, people are just always so strange about how they're really against um, a new skyscrapers going in. Um, because they don't, um, they're not providing enough parking, you know. So, therefore, you know, everybody's up in arms, and then at the same time, they're up in arms about all the traffic that's generating. So that's a very conflicted kind of idea. <laughs> so I'm all for not having any parking at all. Uh, sir, I handed it back. Is that mine? Yeah. Now put out your hands. Um, let me know if you're looking for Oh, thank you. You made a comment about new urbanism, which was to the effect that it uh, wasn't producing uh, very much by way of more affordable housing, if I understood you correctly. Do you have any comments on variations on the new urbanist model, such as in Denver with Stapleton, where essentially the conditions of the development and the land transfer are that they have substantial amounts of affordable housing and where they are requiring the, de the developments put in, the shops, the schools, the various kinds of facilities, and forcing a mixed-use situation right from the inception. Well, you know, the new urbanism is all for affordable housing if it gets handed to them by, you know, the mixed in, the Hope Six projects. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but that, that was what replaced all those high rises coming down. It's called Hope Six. Um, and the new urbanists were very happy to be building that affordable housing. It was handed to them, here's money, make it work, you know, do the designs, create the um, mixed income neighborhoods, you know, working with a lot of other people. So that was great. Um, my criticism has been that, um, you know, they often, it, it's either that or nothing. You know, like either the federal government's going to hand it all to us and we're going to build that, or forget it, it's totally private sector. There's a lot of stuff in between. Uh, most um, new urbanists that I know really hate inclusionary zoning, for example. Um, they don't like anything sort of restrictive. I mean, I'm being too ballpark here. I mean, I'm a card-carrying new urbanist, and I'm for all of these things. So, um, it, but you know, this tendency to be sort of developer-driven and therefore think you can build in affordability and that's it, um, that's, that's the opinion that's been driving me crazy. And I had to go out and collect all the data and put it in their face and show them, you know, this is not what's happening. Even in the survey I did was after the downturn. These places are really retaining a lot of value still, which is a good thing. But you know, we have to be more creative about strategies for building in that diversity. Uh, thank you for riveting presentation. Uh, is it possible to uh, extract a value of subsidy per capita for the total population of the USA, given the, the Constitution, and also uh, the debt, the national debt. Is there any correlation with it or any impedance? Not that I know of. <laughs> that would be quite radical. You're talking theory? Yeah. Theoretically? Yeah. I mean, you know, we're the land of the free. Uh, we are a libertarian society. We are very... You know, you guys are so much more progressive, and even though you don't think you are, but um, that's right. We're catching up to America very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you have that going for you. Um, but yeah, I've never heard such a proposal before. What What did you have in mind? Well, it's relevant in making comparisons between um, the USA nation and Australia to uh, get a very rough. Uh, means of uh, evaluating how we are progressing. That's why I asked the question. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, there is a movement to try to think about housing as being a right. You know, rather, I don't know if that ties into what you're saying. Just like the, um, the living wage. You know, you guys have a living wage here. We have, you know, 
the dollar, um, U.S. dollar and Australian dollar is this equal now. Um, minimum wage, you know, the average waiter or waitress is making, um, I think it's like $8 an hour. So it's nowhere near a living wage. So we're so far off. It's, it's not even funny, but there, there are movements. I, I don't know if it's building and progressing and getting stronger or not. Um, we have this whole tea party business to contend with. I don't know if you guys have tea partiers over here, but um, you know, the, the, also the, the right to have housing is being lumped together with the living wage idea. So maybe there's some movement there. So there's no figure for a value per capita spent on subsidising some of the schemes that you've mentioned tonight. Um, you know, mean like you mean like s affordable housing from the federal government? No, no just the total uh, a value per capita, capita uh, on money spent on the schemes that you've described tonight. Um, I don't think it would be that hard to figure out um, because. Uh, that data exists. I don't, I don't have it offhand, but. OK, thank you. <laughs> would that be a way to compare with what goes on in Australia? Well, uh, it would be a point of comparison, I guess. You have that all. data for Australia? Uh, no, I'm not aware of it. Oh, well, <laughs> let's get together and figure this out then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hi, um, Craig Lyons from the Geography Department. Um, my question ties into what you were just saying about right to housing um, and also, I guess, a methods question. A lot of the data that you used was kind of quantitative big data, which was really interesting and really kind of insightful, but I was wondering if you had a sense of what kind of qualitative data there is out there about people's experiences of um, living, living in the various types of uh, urban environments you've described. Uh, and also what strategies people in inner city environments, uh, poor people in inner city environments have used to uh, kind of hang on to where they are. To hang on to where or, they are? Or, you know, to, to resist kind of the gentrification of yeah. the areas. Well, you know, um, I, when I, I wrote my book called Design for Diversity, I interviewed um, people. I, I, I used all this data to find the most diverse neighborhoods because um, there are diverse neighborhoods out there that are compact, walkable, and diverse. And so I'm kind of fascinated by how in the world did they manage to be like they are and they're out there, so let's study them. And I interviewed all these people. and, and Everyone I talked to, it was a snowballing kind of technique, you know, just talk to so-and-so, talk to so-and-so. And everybody was extraordinarily positive about diversity. So I, I don't know if that's because I was asking questions like, you know, how do you like diversity? <laughs> or, you know, how do you like living in diversity? And everybody's just, you know, super positive. But there were other research shows an opposite kind of reaction. Do you know the work of um, Robert Putnam at Harvard? And he did a study with William Julius Wilson, also at Harvard, the two of them. The most depressing, actually the same time my book came out, where they talked, they interviewed people in Chicago, and it was just all about hatred and, and racism and like diversity would never happen. And it was just totally polar opposite to what I had uncovered. So I think it has to do with how you ask the questions, possibly. Um, so so uh, what, what was the other part of your question? Just about how people kind of negotiate uh, being on low incomes in inner city areas um, when they're being gentrified and do they, what kind of strategies they employ to uh, basically exist. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. just thinking there are, there are a lot of areas in Sydney at the moment um, where there are poor people who are really kind of under the pump um, in Miller's Point and, and in various other places around Sydney and if you had any stories to share with people who are experiencing the same things. You know, um, it's really, it's, I, I don't know enough about it, but I know that um, the gentrification issue in particular because a lot of people are studying it. Do you know this... Um, uh, planner Lance Freeman, he's at Columbia University. 
he studied gentrification in Harlem, in New York City, and really has amazing information. And his bottom line is that actually gentrification is, uh, displacement is not happening like you think it is. Um, it's gentrification is um, helping a lot of people. People don't move out, they move smaller, and they stay in the same neighborhood but they, they, ha they are forced to move from their bigger place, but they stay in the same place to a smaller place because they love what's happening to the neighborhood. So I find that kind of compelling and um, kind of interesting. I always think gentrification is, is more complex than we think. I know sociologists who say gentrification is not a problem at all. And it's just amazing to me how the battle goes on with academics about what is going on with gentrification. Is it good? Is it bad? Are people displaced? Who, who are the winners and losers here? I don't know that we still really have the right story. So um, I, I'd be interested to know what the research says about Sydney. Um, okay, I, I think if you're specifically talking about uh, public housing, you know, as in the Millers Point example and so on, I can refer you to two really good things. There's a special issue of Cities coming out sometime in the next few months, um, edited by um, Ed Getz at University of Minnesota, uh, which is about resistance to uh, uh, public housing uh, dispersal. Um, and. You might want to read my article in that. It's very good. <laughs> um, and uh, it's about Millers Point. And uh, uh, also um, another really uh, uh, quite an old example now, but it, it comes from uh, Midtown in Chicago, uh, where um, in the early stages of um, Hope Six transformations, where a large group of residents actually did uh, what they were able to do at the time was a tenant buyout of buildings. So when the, when the buildings were up for, uh, for uh, demolition and renewal, they, they organised with the help of the university and some other um, foundations and so on, a tenant buyout. Unfortunately, what's happened now, about 10 years on, uh, or more, um, is that uh, because they're essentially now, they are Section 8 voucher tenants of their own um, condo association, um, but the values, the land values and so on have gone up so much in the area that many of the tenants who originally were involved in the cooperative buyout have now had to leave the building. Yeah. Okay, um, last uh, word down here to Jeff. Jeff gets the last word. Word, question, comment. Um, yeah, I guess coming from a, an inner city community, which was one of the, the latter ones to, to gentrify in the form of Redfern Waterloo, one of the things that we found was that people who were moving into the area moved in because they wanted diversity and was, that was something that, you know, the edginess and the, uh, and the diversity was something that they appreciated. The, the process, however, drove out everybody that wasn't in public housing. So the people that were could afford to live in in the area because it was low income housing, basically, were forced out of the city. And Bill Randolph has sort of been plotting the way in which that's been pushed further and further towards the uh, the edge of the of the city. And I guess one of the things that just sort of worried me a little bit in terms of you talking about putting services where you have concentration is if we look at the inner city, that concentration is actually around people that are paying quite a lot for units um, and not for the people that actually are providing the, uh, the density. So the, the issue, I think, in, in Sydney is how do we actually leverage diversity and keep diversity within the inner city? How do we actually get mechanisms that keep some people in there when the market is forcing them out? And I guess that's the question I have for you, is how do you actually resist that market trend which says, we now want to be in the inner city, and the people that used to be in the inner city because no one wants to be there are then pushed out, and that removes the very diversity that you're aiming for. Well, I think the first step is to have the knowledge where that's happening and when it's happening and try to anticipate that kind of change. 
Um, do you have, are you familiar with anti-gentrification ordinances? They have such a thing um, in places, in progressive places. We call that Sip 10. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sip 10's in my book. It's our region. Anyone else want to do that I... <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. anyway, I mean. That's protections that we mentioned. Oh, okay, okay. That's it. That's it. Okay, well, it's something. Um, but keeping on top of it and, know, and you know, this trend data and really seeing where, you know, I showed the, the image of Chicago with those little neighborhoods that are just about to turn, you know, you can see it happening. Um, doing something to support those, those places in a way that doesn't go too far and, you know, make them um, completely unaffordable. But, you know, having some sort of form of in, subsidy in there um, to allow people to stay in place. That's so important too. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna wrap it up. Let me just okay. say one thing before we formally um, thank Emily. Okay. And I just want to pull us back to the conversation in Sydney and say what's absolutely clear, I think, from Emily's work in the United States is that good design, good planning and good design does create an enormous amount of value and, of course, that's what we want to see in Sydney. But we're fooling ourselves if we think that that also enables social diversity and particularly affordable housing. So um, those of you who are sick of hearing me say that, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep on saying that. Um, but let's continue the conversation outside. And thank you um, all for your attendance and for your you know, um, perspectives, but particularly thanks, Emily.